Joining us now is Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. Mr. Secretary, thanks for your time. I want to start with what Kirby calls the irregular operations events. If climate change is clearly uh, only getting worse and we're seeing it across the country right now, what can the administration do? What can airlines do to address something that doesn't seem to be going away or lessening anytime soon? Well, there's no escaping the fact that when you have more severe weather events, both them happening more often and them getting more severe, that's going to affect every form of transportation. We're assessing what those northeast floods have been doing to the roads in New York State and in particular in Vermont. And of course, that's going to affect flight operations. So there's uh, there's a reality in front of us that, uh, you know, we're doing everything we can in the long run fight against climate change to stop this from getting any worse than it has already gotten. We also have to face the reality at hand. That's why for the first time ever, under President Biden's uh, bipartisan infrastructure law, we have billions of dollars in a fund that is specifically for resilience. So with a road, it means if a road is getting washed out annually by what used to be considered a thousand year flood, instead of putting it back the same way it was year after year, let's move it, let's redesign it, let's make it safer and more resistant to floods or droughts, wildfires, or or whatever the biggest threat is. But on the aviation side too, we have to prepare for this. Now, the other remark that, that he made that I agree with is if, if you can't control what the weather is going to be, you have to work on everything you can control about how quickly the system will recover. And I will say that I've been struck by the improvements compared to one year ago that we've seen in the national airspace where we had uh, dramatic storms and uh, disruptions hitting our major hubs, but the system recovering in a way that we would not have seen uh, a year ago. Uh, today, cancellations are below 2%, and we've seen them come back to that more quickly right. than they would have uh, a year ago uh, in terms of dealing with those severe thunderstorms. And that's part of what we're closely watching, making sure the airlines are positioning themselves to recover and then making sure we're right. doing everything we can on the department side and FAA side to make a, the system more flexible. Right. Uh, I do want to ask you about uh, the CEO himself. Uh, he had some very strong words for the FAA during the meltdown late in June uh, when I think United canceled around 3,000 flights. This week, he called the FAA particularly helpful and the air traffic controllers heroic. Um, Did you have anything to do with that shift in tone? Well, uh, certainly we have worked to make sure that there is excellent communication between the FAA and all of the airlines. And look, uh, we have a complicated relationship with the airlines, right? We are often coming down on them hard when it comes to uh, con- customer protection at the very same time that we're working side by side with them to try to make sure that flight operations are, are going well. We are their regulator from a safety perspective as well as a competition perspective, but we're also working to make sure the U.S. aviation sector, uh, it, its interests are being protected in international markets. So, look, there's always going to be a a sometimes very intense push-pull between us and the airlines. But as a regulator, first and foremost, we're going to focus on making sure that passengers are protected. And as a general rule, I think that uh, when we have good, strong rules for the airlines, the airline sector ultimately benefits too because the public is more confident in what they're getting when they buy that ticket. Do you believe that airlines are overscheduled at this point? Well, let me say this. Anytime we see evidence that an airline is deliberately or knowingly scheduling flights that they can't realistically serve, we're going to investigate and we could take action to respond to that, with including punitive action. Uh, we right. are concerned about that. We have some open investigations right now. But I will say the airlines are scheduling more conservatively than they were before. That's one of the things I pushed them for, uh, pushed them on last year when even on so-called blue sky days where weather wasn't much of a factor, you see all these delays and cancellations that were completely unacceptable. Uh, They've got to have schedules that they can serve with the assets that they have. If they don't, that's obviously unfair to passengers who get left in the lurch. And it could also be an indication of an unfair competitive practice. In other words, if an airline is trying to gain market share by selling a schedule that they can't actually back up in a particular route pair, uh, that's a competition issue. And that's another reason why, as a regulator, we're watching very closely. Can I ask you, I want to get to Bidenomics in the, in the economy in a sec, but I do have one final question for you uh, on airline travel. The idea of pilot shortages it has been a significant issue. There are a couple of proposals on Capitol Hill right now in the FAA authorization bill. One, to, to increase the re- retirement age for pilots, I think from 65 to 67. There's also, uh, I think, proposals floating around about uh, easing the number of hours that would need to be flown uh, to some degree. Do you support those or are you in favor of them right now? 
Look, this is right now in the middle of, of complex and sensitive negotiations on Capitol Hill. But the bottom line I'll say is that anything that emerges needs to put safety first. And uh, we can look at a, a lot of different strategies and, and, and policies, but uh, we can't do anything that would weaken safety for passengers, for airlines. That's always going to be our top priority as a department. Can I ask you, uh, talking about the economics issue, you've been one of the kind of leading voices for the administration on what is now uh, firmly referred to as Bidenomics to some degree. It's been a good couple of weeks on that front data wise. But I wanted to ask you about something J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon said in an interview with The Economist. Take a listen. Do you think Bidenomics has been a success? God, it's a tough question to answer. It shouldn't be political. It should be purely economic. And also the fiscal spending, $5 trillion of excess fiscal spending over two years, some to counter COVID, but some is far more in excess. That is causing the inflation. He was nuanced in terms of the issues that he took with some of the approaches that you guys have taken, but I think was broadly suspect of uh, the overarching theory of the case. What's your response to that? Well, uh, look at the numbers and look at where we are. You know, uh, it's pretty rare to have inflation under 4% and unemployment under 4% at the same time. Uh, matter of fact, that's extraordinary, especially where you consider where we've come from. Under President Biden's leadership, uh, more than 13 million jobs created. That's never happened under any president in anything close to this period of time. And in something that matters a lot to me coming from the industrial Midwest, a lot of those are manufacturing jobs, the kinds of jobs we used to be exporting overseas. Uh, you know, got, got a lot of respect for him as a, as a business leader. Uh, but remember, one of the core elements of Bidenomics is putting a focus on the middle class and working people, making sure that the economy grows from the bottom up and the middle out. And that's obviously not always the same priority you're going to see in, in the investment banking community uh, versus how important that is and how central that is to what President Biden and this administration are about. Right. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. Unfortunately, we're running up against the end of this hour. I could talk to you about this stuff for a while. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate it.